It's Monday, February 8th, 2016. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights Tonight, Why Twitter Can't Make Money. Let's, Let's do this. So I finally did it. Uh, it was one of those shit or get off the pot moments. I, I So two thi- I purchased two things in the last 12 hours. Because if something you purchase be, is a, is worthy of opening, but it must be expensive. They're moderately expensive, but they're technology. But there's there's a thing that I've noticed. I it bothers me when other people do it, and I vowed to never do it myself. Where you have a complaint, like I'm doing X and I'm a professional at X, but there is a problem doing X, and yet there is Y, a piece of technology that will actually fix X. If you're a professional. And you need Y to do X because your profession is X and you don't buy Y and you keep complaining about how annoying it is to do X, you are not actually a professional. Usually that's a situation where the this problem should have been solved by uh, adding the feature of that accessory to the original thing, right? Well, yeah, there, there's a lot of nuance there. Or it might be like, I mean, in the 90s or even actually not that long ago, like, want to edit video? Well... Here are your options. That's like saying, man, driving this car sucks. I sure wish it had brakes. Well, why didn't you buy brakes? It's like the car should include brakes. Yeah, but what about, say, I want to do chroma keying, but it's 1920. <laughs> that doesn't exist in 1920s. Well, actually, it kind of did. Really? Yeah, but not the, it was not done much the same way we do it now, but similar things could be done. Mm-hmm. Chemical processes and such. I was reading a lot about that stuff. I guess you could do something with a completely black background and light only the front things and then run the film through again. Yeah, or you could use, you could probably do masks and all sorts That's of stuff. That's what I'm like, saying. Yeah, automate a mask by overexposing one part all the way up. Then you have the mask and then you can re-expose other, f- all sorts of nonsense. So anyway, I was editing the Utena videos, you know, the Patreon thing, and a bunch of PAX videos and everything. And I keep having to shuttle and jog around the videos. And I'm doing what I always do. I'm futzing around with the mouse and keyboard and back and forth. And it's just not that fun. And then I remembered that jog wheels exist. Well, what's your mouse sensitivity? It's it's not a matter of that. Or your, you can set your mouse wheel how many clicks is a click. Oh, no, it's not, it's not that matter. I can click one frame at a time. The difference is a nice jog wheel. Like at RIT in the labs, we had, like, editing consoles. There's Imagine, like, a big fucking wheel with a lot of weight to it. You can sort of spin and slide. It's really I mean, comfortable to use. Does your mouse wheel unlock and spin like whoosh? This one does not. I have oh, another mouse oh. that does. Yeah, then... So I feel I like on, you just wanted to waste money on something fancy. No, because I remember <laughs> editing video with a jog wheel and with a shuttle ring around it, and it was just a lot faster. Mm-hmm. And you're in that much of a hurry? Yeah, actually. I feel I, like that isn't something that's so much of a pain that the mouse wheel's no good. Well, I got to the point where I have a lot of video to edit that involves a lot of, like, like the Utena stuff, especially now, is mostly me jogging around inside of a bunch of like whole episodes of Utena to find individual frames and like exact. I mean, there points. are definitely specialized tools to make things easier that are useful, but I feel like that is a borderline, uh, you know, you've, not, not necessary. You've ca- never really. It's put a borderline. Together, it's a borderline garlic press. You've that's nev- all I'm saying. You've never put together a complex video. Look at the timeline of these stupid Utena things, and you'll see. But anyway, I thought, hey, maybe, you know, a long time ago I looked for these things and I didn't buy one because they were all in thousands of dollars or they were just a mouse. Like there was no. No, you can buy just a wheel now. Pretty Uh, cheap. Yeah. So I went around looking online and most of the wheels. I see actually seen some kickstarted at some point. uh, Yeah. And I researched all those. And basically what I discovered is that there are a few things that are super good, but they're still expensive. There's things that work pretty well. But they're not better enough than just a mouse to justify spending any amount of money on them. And then I found one thing that was $80, and it appears that everyone else who edits video, even like professionals, pretty much used that one. I asked around, everyone's like, oh yeah, that one's great. So I bought it. And it's it's gonna make my editing life a lot easier. You're gonna have fun playing with the knob. At least there's one thing you can say about buying that garlic press. Well, borderline garlic press, not quite as bad as a garlic press. <laughs> uh, that makes it kind of okay. And that is, you can play breakout or pong with it. Yeah, actually, the ulterior motive. <laughs> I want to see if I can or, play kaboom uh, with it. You can play warlords with it. I might be able to <laughs> set it up, and then we can add some Atari games to our panel. So at any, anything with a dual purpose gets you know gets a pass. 
But uh, the other thing is I actually finally bought a new phone. Oh, okay. The Sony Xperia Z5 Compact came out in America with every LTE channel that I care about. Legit. Like, I can buy it for real, not some gray market nonsense. I can buy it basically direct from Sony on Amazon or B&H or whatever. And I did my last cursory research. Apparently, Marshmallow came out, and they all upgraded just fine. Is it? But does it have any weird stuff, or is it pure, unadulterated Android? So I really dug into what Sony does, because of course it's weird stuff. There's only one line of phones that doesn't have any weird stuff. And the Sony stuff the is... The iPhone? Uh, well, like Nexus phones. <laughs> Yeah, I looked into also the new small Apple phones, and I'm not going to wait for the unicorn to come out because my my Nexus Five is a little uh, hardware compromised. I'm kind of I was kind of wait like counting down the minutes before it actually does die. And the fact that this thing is waterproof, I've been complaining about how there's no good small phone forever. And while this is not a perfect phone, it is literally the best Android hardware on the market in the entire world today. Full stop. So you bought the least smelly poop. Yeah, I bought the best Android hardware. See, I just buy the gold, Jerry. Gold. Yeah, so this is an experiment because if it's good, if it works, if my feeling that having a small phone with good hardware is better than the the alternative, then I was right all along. And if I'm wrong, I can resell it for almost as much as I bought it for and just buy the iPhone 5 SE yeah. whatever when it comes out. I'm probably going to... Apple's doing this thing now where you sort of pay for your iPhone every month and it, you can upgrade your phone every year. So just always have the current iPhone. You just always have the newest phone and uh, you get Apple Care forever also. It's like free. Free uh, instead of paying 100 bucks a year yeah. for it or whatever. So if anything happens to it, oh, you're fine. So the, the well, actually the main thing was... Because it's waterproof, that's increasingly a problem for me. Like, I kind of need a waterproof phone. Well, the iPhone is actually more waterproof than, just, than you would expect. Oh, well, yeah. It's, it's not it's, super waterproof. So yeah. And Apple don't advertise that fact, but it's they keep making it more and more waterproof every release. Yeah, but I'm they sure don't get the, like, certification. They're not going to say it's waterproof. Because they want to fuck you if you get it in the water. Well, also, they don't want to deal with the edge case of, yeah, it's pretty much waterproof, Yeah, but... as soon as if they actually said iPhones are waterproof now, people would be dumping that shit in the swimming pool and be like, ha, it broke, ha. Yeah, so I'm getting my new waterproof phone. I'm still not going to throw it in the pool. <laughs> I'm still not going to shower with it. They're going to take it in the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it says specifically no salt water. Oh, okay. Yeah. There is a fully waterproof version, but I don't need that. Yeah, anyway. But knowing it, especially because my, my Nexus 5, uh, you know, it, it's kind of damaged because I dropped it on those rocks in Hong Kong. Oh, good and it job. works fine, but it has a hole right in the bottom. That water could just get in. Isn't that where the USB goes in? No, USB goes down here. <laughs> not on the bottom? Yeah, the front is cracked, like where the screen, because that's where I hit the <laughs> rock with it. Why you, rocks. Why are you doing that? Because I was running in the mountains and I needed a GPS, so I didn't get lost because I'm in fucking Hong Kong. And I had Hong literally Kong's not that big. It's like a little island. Yeah. So How I had literally lost? the day before the trip, I gotten my new Nexus Five because my Nexus Four had finally died. Well, and can the you Nexus get a Nexus Five for like five bucks a dozen in Hong Kong? So the Nexus Five was just a little bit bigger than the Nexus Four, so it wouldn't fit in the armband that I put on when I ran with it, so I had to carry it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't like big phones. So this is it. Either you're, I'm going to talk about how great it is to have a small phone again, or Android is dead. <laughs> you're going to find out in about a week because the phone arrives tomorrow. All right, so I got, I got an open event. It's, you know, I don't know. Someone's probably going to give me shit about this. But anyway. Ooh, all right. I've always given people shit who have pains. And I'd be like, I don't have any pains. You Wait. know, that is true, Scott, because many times when uh, you've had a pain or I've had a pain, if I have a pain, I'll just take an aspirin and I'll be fine. If you have a pain, you'll bitch about it, but you won't take aspirin. You'll just sit there bitching about it. Uh, yeah, but I usually don't have pains. Yeah, uh, and I also tell people like you know, like people got back pains, and I'd be like, hey, I just hunch over. I never have any pain. Look at you standing up straight. It hurts all the time. You shouldn't stand up straight. Just hunch and be comfortable like me. Yeah, you know what? That's just because your back's messed up because you've been hunching for so long. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but it, now suddenly, of course, the comeuppance that was expected uh -oh. came sooner than expected. Back pain? My back hurts. Upper or lower? In a weird, it hurts in one spot, like on the left in the middle. Left in the middle, like just south of your shoulder blade? Uh, a little, I mean, quite a bit south, but not, right. not super south. Because you know that every study says that the cure for lower back pain is fuck you. 
Yeah, pretty much. There's just nothing. You're done. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not really lower. It's in the middle. But yeah, I mean, I know that there is no cure for back pain. Why don't you get some chiropractic homeopathy? No, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it hurts. Whatever. All the time? Like, you go to a doctor? Uh, I didn't go to... I mean, it only started hurting, like, maybe halfway through two days ago. Oh, huh? maybe it's an acute pain. Maybe you just, like... It still hurts, though. Moved it a weird way. It changes... I mean, Scott, we're humans. We're over 30. The reality is sometimes you wake up and something just hurts for a few yeah, days. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, but I can't like, tell if I'm hurt because I hurt myself anymore or if I'm hurt because I'm over 30. Yeah, I don't know. Because sometimes, one day, like, a, like a month ago, I woke up, my elbow, my right elbow just hurt. And I kept hurting for, like, two weeks... And then it just stopped hurting. So mm. all I could think was, well, I guess that was pain, like right. injury and not old. Right. So anyway, so it, it started hurting. I went to bed. I woke up. It hurt more. And I said, oh, why is it still hurt? Uh-oh. Yeah. Right. So then I took one dose of Tylenol and it made no difference. So really? whatever. Right. I would I would go. You know, most people use other drugs. I actually still use aspirin 90 percent of the time right. if I take a pain medicine. So then this morning when I got to work, right, it was like, you know, I was moving pretty slow. So for the first time in my entire life, I went into the closet at the office and I took instead of acetaminophen, there was also ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is my number two man. So I took it's, I think it said to take one. I took one that also did nothing. Oh, uh. so. Uh, but then I guess I took it at nine in the morning. How long does it usually take to work? I don't know, like an hour, or forty. Yeah, minutes? okay, it definitely didn't work because I was hurting the same amount until like maybe three, <laughs> and then it stopped hurting. Yeah, I mean it didn't stop hurting, but it hurts less now than it did at nine. But huh. not, it didn't change really at all until three. So, well, was one the actual dose? How many milligrams did you take? It said to take one. Oh, okay. On the bottom, I read, I, one, I read the instructions. One, you're you're using unitless measures. One what? One, one ibuprofen pill from the bottle of of generic orange stuff I mean, that was in the closet at the office. Like how many milligrams? Like you want six hundred milligrams of gryfenicin, but you want like sixty milligrams of pseudoephedrine. I mean, I can go look at it again tomorrow, but I don't really care. I took the recommended dosage of one, and nothing had nothing affected my pain in, until three. And it still is definitely uncomfortable. But well, it hurts less from what I've now. read, back pain is one of the things where unless you get dangerous painkillers, they really don't do anything for it. That makes sense. Other pains, like if you had a headache, like wh- half a dose of aspirin, that thing's gone. I don't unless have it's headaches. a migraine. I'm saying if you did, if yeah. if somehow the uh, the Ubermensch got a headache, then so half if anyone's, an aspirin would if anyone's got it. a robot body, I mean, I've you know I've been waiting one patiently, but you know. The clock's ticking here. I need the robot body a little sooner than nope. expected. It's just—it's always interesting that you're a very pro robot body, yet you won't use existing body technology to make yourself feel better. Like if I'm sick, is it right? Because I'll just okay. take whatever drugs, fully no, aware no, no, of no, the no, side no, effects, no, 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 no. because why feel pain? No, no, why no, 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 no. feel discomfort? See, ever? here's your problem, right? See, if you take drugs, I've only got this biological body, and the odds yeah. are that's all I'm gonna have. Scott, we know so what the side effects are of things like some, aspirin. You're taking some drugs, you're gonna fuck up this biological body, and then what? Scott, how is aspirin if gonna fuck up your body? If I get a robot body, right? I don't have to worry about fucking up a biological body. Yeah, you I'm, do, Scott. Have you ever like tried to flash a BIOS and just shit's broken now? You're gonna flash your butt just, bios and the just butt's just the gonna whole, stop. I could just replace the whole goddamn you're thing. Get, your butt's just gonna like fall off and have an error code yeah. on it. I got a robot you the body. Wrong firmware. It's like I, you're set. You can just no. Oh, I don't give a shit. You're gonna get some butt malware and well, I guess butt malware is just food poisoning. I'll just reinstall my whole OS from scratch, just like I do with my computer. My just, computer has a lot less problems than my biological body does. My, you know what? I was I was gonna say yeah, I agree with you. Eh? I can take care of a, a you know technological body. I can't really do much. Even doctors well, who are specialists, you know, if I go to the Scott, the, the only reason this, you bring me a broken computer and you bring a broken body to a hospital, all right, Scott, the hospital I, cannot restore that broken body to perfection, but I can restore that computer to perfection. All right, Scott. Every so time. here's one up on you. I'm gonna bring you a computer from 34 fucking years ago. Restore that shit. I can. I got all an right. Apple IIgs in my closet. Works great. <laughs> Works better know. than your computer. <laughs> Works better than your brand new computer. Yeah, it's not gonna render any video anytime soon. And though. you know what? If I spend a little money on eBay, I can make it work so good. Yeah, but you know what? The other thing is when you t- when you take your computer to the computer doctor, he just pulls out all the shit that's broken and just replaces it. Yeah, it's the that's no one's why it's great to have a robot body. When I broke that rib at Magfest a couple of years ago, no one like that's tore why into biological my chest. bodies suck and I don't want one. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just, you know, do instant part replacement without any problems. But Scott, you know what it's like? You know when you got a raid and one of the discs dies? So, boop, boop. 
the equivalent of taking some aspirin, like, if the, you could just stop using the drive and just not have access to that data until it rebuilds. Or you can let it start rebuilding and keep using the data. The danger is minuscule, negligible, but you have access to your data. So if I got, say, a headache, like just headache happens, I could either suffer through it for no reason or take an aspirin to not feel it. And as long as I remember that, hey, Rim, you had a headache, you don't feel it now, but you are you basically turned off that error warning. You acknowledged that error in the alert console. You might fuck up your stomach with that aspirin. Uh, Well, I don't seem to have that problem. That's not everyone has those problems. And if you're going to have that problem, take ibuprofen instead. If you still have that problem, I'd- take Tylenol. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Tylenol is definitely my go-to because I feel like... Tylenol uh, causes more systemic damage than either aspirin or ibuprofen. But it causes damage to what? The liver. The liver, which, in someone who doesn't drink, is mad strong. Uh, my liver is ready for beating. My liver is like, not done any work ever, so it's ready for all kinds of acetaminophen clearing action. Liver does way more than deal with alcohol. I'm alcohol saying, is a relatively I'm minor saying, part. If I have to compare, right, if I'm going to... If I have to go to battle with one of my internal organs, and I can send either my stomach, my liver, or... If I have to go to battle with an internal organ, I'm going for the appendix, gallbladder, (laughs) something I can just fucking cut out and get rid of. Just fire it. I think my liver is going to... If you've got a bad ram steak, you just pull it out and you're good to go. I think my liver is going to win more battles and has more uh, hit points than the others. So if I'm going to do some damage, I'll take it in the liver. We get what we have a liver off? I'll allocate my... Three right torso damage to the liver. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't, don't worry about the crit chance. Yeah, not going to get a crit chance on the liver. <laughs> My stomach, though, might get a crit, and then, you know, bad news. So I got a tech news, which is one of those funny tech newses. It's, it's the classic line of, didn't know X existed until Facebook announced they're shutting X down. Okay. So a bunch of my coworkers is, were we flipping out because they're like, oh, my God, Facebook shut down Parse. Yep. And I was like... Well, they didn't shut it down yet. They're, they they're going to shut it they're down. They're shutting it down a year from now. Uh, oh, Slash Dot's funny. It's for those working in the ass business, <laughs> just as a service. Yep. So Parse shut down is going to shut down. And but the so I didn't know what Parse was, mm-hmm. but the headline told me immediately because what they what it basically said was Facebook never wanted to host apps to begin with. They literally bought it so developers could use the Facebook login full stop. Yep. They bought it's one of those situations where a large company like Facebook bought another company's thing to literally get one of its features and fuck all the rest of that nonsense that came along with it. Right. So this so parse was this thing that sort of started to solve like this one small problem and they over engineered it and ended up building what is known as infrastructure as a service. So basically, let's say you're writing like an iOS app and you know, you need some sort of back end that is not in the app itself. Like maybe, for example, you're making a video game and you want to store a database of high scores, right? And you don't want to use like Apple Game Center. You want to have like your own high score database yep. somewhere. Or maybe you want to have your game players like log in and have a friends list and, you know, do these sorts of things. Now, right? the traditional way to do that was you have hosting in the sky somewhere, and maybe you redundant. Build, and you write an application. Yep. And you put the you host the application on some servers. And that application probably has a bunch of like you make an component a- applications. Like you write your application, but then you've also got like MySQL running behind it. Right, yeah, yeah. And know, Apache and yeah, a bunch you, of nonsense. You actually build a web service of some kind or an internet service. Yeah, and know? there's a whole Linux an a- server. An, you ap- can- an application. You write one and you run it. Yeah, but on top of an entire Linux server on hardware. Right. And then a little revolution was servers as a service or, you know, like an Amazon instance. So you run a whole Linux server, it's just virtualized. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the actual... But what Scott's talking about is way beyond that. So what Parse does is basically you don't have to write an application or run servers or do anything. They pretty much just provide a Gennaro web user interface customizable infrastructure. So you can just be like, you want to make a high score list? You just go to Parse and be like, well, username, high score... Login, password, you know, do this, do that. And now you can write your game. And in the game that you write, you know, while you're writing your iOS code in C, sh- C uh, Objective C, or uh, what's the other thing that they made? Uh, you know, that Swift, right? Oh. <laughs> you, just, you just include, you know, the parse library. And now you can use the parse API 
to communicate with this infrastructure. Now you don't have to build Linux servers. You don't have to write an application. You don't have to do anything. It ju- you don't have to set up databases. Yep. You just. I mean, Amazon has a bunch of this stuff too. Parse is your infrastructure. Like you can use, a- you can like you can run an Amazon instance and run like Postgres right. on it, or you can just use Amazon's database. There's right, no so server. We use, we use Parse at work, but actually the only thing we use it for is to send iOS notifications. We don't use it for anything else. <laughs> uh, so we can replace it with something else. Yeah, there's a lot. Isn't I think there's a notification vacation thing on Amazon you could actually just use. Uh, maybe, but you know, there's plenty of alternatives. Yeah. Right? But yeah, uh, Facebook's shutting it down and I guess, you know, it, it really bothers me that there's like a market for a lot of these things because on the one hand, you know, this all really started with like the Heroku, which is like, it's one thing to sell hosting, right? Because that's all Amazon is really doing is selling hosting. Yeah. Right? It's like, well, except I don't have a data center. I want to pay to use computers in your data center, and I don't really care what CPUs are in them. I just want computers that run. But Linux. that's not super scalable because then you still have to make your application like deal with multiple servers and all that nonsense. That's you have right. to monitor that you shit. Should do right. It's like a lot of these things. It gets to a point where it's like it's one thing to pay someone to take care of something for you. It's another thing to pay someone to so that you don't have to know something, right? It's like people use Heroku so that they could write a Ruby on Rails app without having to know anything about databases or Unix or anything like that. And they so end there up paying th- way too much and getting way too little for So there is money. a counterpoint there, though. Like a lot of the Amazon stuff, like especially use like the Elastic Beanstalk or like some other like basically spinning up code on the fly. So if someone like uploads a video to your web server and then it automatically spins up however many threads it needs out in the cloud somewhere to do like the transcoding or whatever. So that way you can scale automatically and only pay for your load. You can also do that no matter what. Nah, because spinning up... You can just do that with EC2 instances. You can say, you know, CloudWatch, if CPU usage on any of these machines gets too high... Launch another machine with this AMI. Yeah, so it might, that might Elastic take... Elastic Beanstalk just does the same thing. Even if you use Elastic Beanstalk, you still have to know about Unix and computers. And you're not outsourcing your knowledge. Yeah, but you're outsourcing having to scale on a per-computer basis. You're like, not outsourcing having to know anything. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. I've noticed, just in my industry, you know, finance, mm. there are companies that use services like all this Amazon nonsense because... They realize that it has a scaling or a feature. There's something it does that is useful to them, but they know how to do that thing right. on do a server. Use, people who use Parse for like it, its full infrastructure as a surface, pe- people do that because they don't know how to make an infrastructure. They don't know how to set up an administer a Unix server or write an API or use a database, and they just want to make a web, uh, an iOS app or something and not have to know any of or, that. This is or, why or... They use it for rapid time to market to get a thing that works, and if it gets big, they'll deal with replacing that with real infrastructure later. Why waste effort if you just want to see right. if the thing's going to work? But this is why you get things like the Node.js. It's like people learn JavaScript and HTML and CSS, and they don't want to have to know anything else. So let's just, it, well, we'd rather do a bunch of work and develop this whole Node.js thing so that we can also write JavaScript in the server instead of just learning, because that's, even though that's more effort, they don't. For some reason, people like against learning. They would rather do a whole bunch of work to use a language they already know in a different way than just learn something new. Hey, if someone else does that work, but you're, it's basically like someone hey, else let's use made the node. worst programming language in the world on the server. Also, it's yeah. a great idea. At least even the, the people who are node evangelists are like, yeah, don't do any serious processing on that thing. And I'm like, so what? So you've got a back end. And a back end and a front end now, two of which are JavaScript. Why? <laughs> Why can't your like JavaScript front end talk directly to your Java like, whatever back end? It seems like there's so many, you know, all the hotnesses now these days aren't new things. They're just people reinventing the wheel in different ways so that they don't have to learn the existing ways to do a thing. It's like, I don't want to have to learn how to make a, an API. I just want right? I'll just use parse. I'll pay money to avoid learning. Yeah, but that, that's the thing. There's I'll a do a whole bunch of work rewriting, you know, making JavaScript work on a server so I don't have to learn Python or Ruby or C or anything like, or Go. Yeah, so today, randomly, I was we have like a MATLAB or thing Java. I'm working on. So I wanted, to, I wanted to make a web server thingy just to kind of try some stuff out because I had some REST interface in the back end. So I spun up Flask, and hey, that totally just worked immediately. Mm. And it was pretty cool. And I had recently done some Node stuff and the, the, the comparison between working with the two was stark, to say the least. 
But there is a difference between the people who are doing what you're saying who use services like this to avoid knowledge versus people who use it because they understand what it offers and have a reason. I think the latter is probably more successful, but also more rare. I also, you know, even if you have a valid use for parse, like you just want to get something up quick and you're going to replace that part later, like you plan to replace it later anyway, uh, I really don't like... You know, this the, I, on Amazon, we only use things, at least I only use things that can be swapped because they have a standard API. For example, if you use Amazon RDS, it's just MySQL or it's just Postgres. You can yeah. cancel it and just use a MySQL server and you're good. If you use Amazon SES, which is their email service, well, we just talked to it using SMTP. So we could replace that with like Postfix or SendMail like tomorrow. Yeah. But if we were to use Amazon... I don't know what what's one of the weird things they have. Well, like, like Elastic simple, Beanstalk is one of the weirder ones. Well, no, you use like Amazon Simple Q service. Oh yeah. You can't just swap that out for Rabbit MQ or Zero MQ because it has its own API. So you'd have to recode a whole bunch of stuff to switch away from that. It's not using a standard AMQ. P there's interface. there's a more fundamental thing though is if the company that provides your ass infrastructure, I, I'm gonna start calling it that from now on, mm -hmm. uh, is not a company that sells ass. Do not trust it with your ass. <laughs> like Don't Amazon, trust at least anyone with your ass. Amazon is an infrastructure as a service company. Like that's a, like that. Like AWS. Like that is a like that's I a consider, business. I consider Amazon just be a hosting provider. Yeah, but I but all that like at least they provide that stuff as a primary business. So it's not the worst idea to build a business on top of it. But Facebook primarily provides racist uncles. So I don't. I wouldn't really build my ass infrastructure on top of racist uncles. <laughs> Just don't use third. You know, if you're paying for someone to do something for you technologically, it should be something that you can swap out. Like you pay Linode for a Linux machine, well, you can just swap it out for your own Linux machine. And if you decide not if to you, take that you, advice, if you develop your thing on Parse using the Parse API. You're wholly dependent on Parse's continued existence. You can't just swap it out. Yeah, see also people who use unpublished APIs of larger companies. Yeah, don't do that. Or do it and just realize that you literally built your business on top of a, I don't know, collapsing pile of sand and rotten wood. All right, so, you know, once in a while, someone comes out with, like, a chatbot that's like, whoa, it's the new impressive chatbot. Wow, whoa. And it's slightly more impressive than the previous chatbots and talking about Turing tests and AIs and stuff, right? Yep. And then people forget about it. It's cute for a few days at the end, right? Well, apparently in China, there is a new chatbot called Xiao Ice or Xiao East. I can't tell. I think it's Xiao Ice. Anyway, this chatbot, you can just chat it up on a Weibo, which is like, I guess, Twitter, Facebook yeah. of China, right? Uh. And apparently, like it's in Chinese, you can't you can't talk to it unless you know Chinese. Um, but this article all about it has a lot of transcripts from it that are in English. They translated, so you can see how amazing it is. And you know, it uses the same sort of like you know, um, uh, you know, machine learning that has been all the rage these days. Yeah, this thing I think is notable. In that it is pro it is not just one step ahead of the previous chatbot that was exciting, which I guess was Eliza maybe or something. I don't know. Well, so there's a side conversation. I actually have this. This chatbot is maybe like five steps ahead of the previous chatbot. I have a bunch of articles saved. Actually, I wanted to do a main like a show on this in the future of the reverse uses of chatbots. There are chatbots that are designed to predict what you would say to people, so it can respond automatically for you on social media and be indistinguishable from what you would have said anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the real awesome and scary shit about chatbots. Yeah. But anyway, this chatbot is, you know, it's just like this person to talk to and is like at least five steps ahead of any previous chatbot I've seen. So I think developments in this, uh, you know, past the Turing test area are perhaps accelerating. Oh, uh, not just Turing test. <laughs> I think machine learning had a recent subtle acceleration because go... Wasn't solved, but there's that AI that basically no human can beat now. Like, people were saying that wouldn't happen in our lifetime, and it appears that it already happened. Well, people are just taking the Google straight. You know, Google recently opened up their, uh, what the hell did they name the stupid thing? I keep forgetting the name of it. Oh, yeah, because I, I was just reading the article on it. We were talking about it the other day. Yeah. Um, you know, their, their machine learning thing that I'll probably remember the name of later in the show. If I can go find the article on the Go thing, because I was arguing with someone on yeah. YouTube about but it. But basically, Google's strategy has always been to replace the fact that, like, look, we can't code the logic of a brain. Let's just 
get so much data that it doesn't matter. And that's the strategy these days. And that's worked. I mean, look, chess is not just solved. Get, just get so much data that we don't have to think of a, a fancy algorithm because that's too hard to do. It's much easier to just get like 10 terabytes of data and do a dumbass algorithm. Yeah. Well, like, look, chess is not solved, yet AI, humans cannot beat machine learning AI at chess. Full stop. That's why you never hear about human versus computer contests anymore. Humans cannot win. Mm-hmm. Ever. Go hit that same point now, allegedly. Like, go. Humans have nothing to add because humans just can't do it anymore. Humans have no more contributions to the world of Go, except among other humans. I don't know if that's true yet, but it's almost true. Well, it's we'll like, see. That AI is getting tested now like by Like, if a you were going to of... draw a line on the timeline of history at when that became true, we're probably underneath the line somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So maybe there has been an increase. Maybe I should start checking on like the current state of machine learning. Like, so what's- uh, there was actually Google put up a free machine learning course, and I went and I watched like the first YouTube video, and that is definitely not a course that uh, I think they lied about the prerequisite knowledge that was required. <laughs> <laughs> Because the guy basically asked you a question, and he didn't... It's one of those teachers that I hate, like my 10th grade chemistry teacher, who asked the question before teaching you anything. They ask the question, and then they answer it afterwards. Yep. And it's like, fuck you, teach me, and then ask me, dumbass. <laughs> and he's like, me to answer, it's like, it's like, what's one plus one? And you're like, what the hell is plus? And then afterwards, you're like, it's two. This is what plus is. And it's like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> I can't sit through this. Teach me what plus is. You know, show me one plus one, then ask me two plus three. That's how you teach. All right? Well, maybe. Uh, so I couldn't, I couldn't learn machine learning from that machine learning course. Um, not <laughs> <laughs> there's something ironic in there somewhere. I had to. I have to find another source of learning machine learning. So actually, talking about learning, this is a total tangent, but I, there's a bunch of research kind of recently. You know the idea that different humans have different styles of learning? That might be all bullshit. There might be, like, objectively superior ways for people to learn and people who learn by other methods are just worse at learning overall and people who like some like if you have someone who's good at learning and someone who's bad at learning the person who's bad at learning might do a little bit better with an alternative method but the person who's good at learning will do objectively worse like far worse with that same alternative method and there's a whole bunch of st- studying recently around how humans learn and there might be some objective truths i think it pretty much just comes down to do you want to learn? If you want to uh, learn, you're going to want to learn. No, actually. So you're saying that, that people can learn really well who don't want to? Uh, no, there are people who want to learn but can't. That's true. That's And that's the most, probably the most tragic thing in the world. But I think if you don't want to learn, you ain't going to learn. But is no not... No matter what method. Human learning is probably just some complex and fuzzy machine learning, so... You, you know, just you get enough data. Yeah, I mean, here we're we're just like fuzzy logic nonsense machines. But anyway, things of the day. So I found this video, and then I realized it was Eight Bit Guy. We featured his uh, some of his stuff in the past. I, you know, I've wanted to use a few of his videos for things of the day, but I don't want to use the same guy so much. Exactly, so. especially because a lot of the ones that I of his that are my favorite are well. Anyway, this video actually kind of stood out. He took one of those, like, crapo APC, like, backups with, like, the lead-acid battery, like, you know, here's your UPS to keep your computer going for, like, five minutes after the power goes out. And he drills it apart and talks about how to make it a hundred times better and how poorly made these things are. And it teaches you a lot. Like, if you are young and you might go into IT and you might need to know about, like, these, like, in data centers, like why DC power and power buses and like AC and all like that world and why it actually matters to know about that stuff. This video will pretty much summarize everything you need to know in that regard about why maybe we don't actually want AC power within our data centers. I mean, pretty much anything modern runs on DC power. It's just DC power is hard to distribute. AC power is kind of shitty at moving anything other than like a heater or a motor that spins. I mean, usually in a data center at the at the you know on each rack, you've got you know an AC to you've DC a, converter, yeah, and then all usually, the computers take DC, right? No, usually you've still got a you have, PDU. You have, you have little power supplies in each rack mounted. Yes, computer. you have a PDU that distributes the AC power to all the power supplies that, that, that are that redundant. That sounds suboptimal. Uh, so it is, and is it even isn't. Google and Facebook and the really big data centers doing it that way too? So some data centers will use direct DC power. But it is such a fucking pain in the ass to deal with that stuff. Oh, it's almost 
it ends up being cheaper for a lot of people to deal with all the problems of AC distribution. But I feel like so many power supplies is like so many more points of failure. Yeah. Welcome to the world of data center management. You want to learn the whys of this? Just go to college for like five years. Anyway. So this video is fascinating if you don't know about this stuff. And even if you do know about it, like a lot of, pe a lot of people think if they have like a, a UPS that the computer's running off the battery and the battery's just constantly being charged. That is not how most shit tier UPSs work. No, the battery just sits around. But the way this guy modded this one, it does work that way now, and it's way better. Wouldn't the battery, though, like lose its life if you it's keep doing it? It's lead-acid batteries. They don't lose their life ever. Really? They're basically invincible. A lead-acid battery can just keep getting recharged lead -acid batteries, and used yeah. forever? Why do you think your car battery lasts forever unless you break it or something? Car batteries don't last forever. They last for long goddamn time. They last longer than any lithium-ion battery you're ever going to see. Sure. Anyway. Anyway, this video is great. Uh, so way back in the day, like the '80s, there were these computer learn how to you know these computer learning books, and if maybe you've recognized them if you see the cover. They were published by U.S. Usborn Children's Books. Uh, they had books such as Machine Code for Beginners, Computer Programming. They also had books that had like listings, like here is a program in BASIC. Type this into your you know ZX Spectrum. And then it'll run, and you'll be able to play an adventure game. I used to get magazines. A lot of magazines had like basic programs in them. So, and I didn't have a computer, so I was always desperate to be able to type them into something. Right. So, you, so Usborn has two modern computer books to teach kids about computers. Those books are Code for Beginners Using Scratch, which is this uh, really cool MIT sort of learning computer language thing. It's kind of fun. And another book called Lift the Flap, Computers and Coding. But... All them old books from the 80s, they have them on their website. You just click and you see them. They're just there. They oh, have man. A, they have a copyright notice, and the way the copyright license is is that they own the copyright. It's not Creative Commons. You can't redistribute these PDFs on your own, but as long as you come to their website and click, you can get a PDF and use it all you want for yourself. I kind of want to go there and copy paste some old basic programs into well, an emulator. I don't know if you, can, you copy paste out of a, a PDF into a well, ZX you know, I could do it old school. emulator. I could do it old school and literally just type the code in. Yeah, I mean, come and take my Apple II GS and we'll type the code in. Maybe we should. That'd be there. Let's let's we should make a Let's Play video where we do that. The problem with my Apple II GS is not that it's broken in any way. Is that I only have five and a quarter inch floppy drives and five and a quarter inch floppies. You can get a three and a half inch floppy drive for it and use three and a half inch floppies. I do not have those, and they are not the price they are on eBay is not really worth it to me. Yeah, we'd get like a few weeks worth of entertainment, and we'd probably not use it ever I again. I can. The, the best method of getting software into one of those is a method I have available, which is I plug a USB cable into my computer, then I have a little converter, and then it turns into a modem cable, and then I go to the Apple II and I say, hey, Apple II, you're getting a phone call. Take all the data you're getting from the phone call and run it. And then on my computer, I say, hey, computer, see this file I downloaded from the internet that contains Apple II software? Send it over the USB cable. AT, AT. I also have another method, which is where I download a file, right, of Apple II software. Yep. And I turn it into a WAV file because, you know, a lot of them were just on cassette tapes or whatever. It, you know, modem is just audio too, right? It doesn't matter. Yeah. And then... I take a headphone cable from my iPhone and I plug it into the in uh, the microphone hole on the on the Apple II and I press play on the wave file and turn the volume all the way up. I still have well I don't have them anymore. My mom probably has them. I have cassette tapes that have programs on I them. I can even do it by opening Safari on my iPhone and typing in a URL of a wave file and pressing play <laughs> and download something from the internet over the Wi-Fi directly into my Apple II. So, in the minute moment, we were just at PAX South. Uh, three panels. I have video of four panels. One of them is already on YouTube. I was on a Scared Yet, a discussion of horror and games with Chris Straub, uh, Dave Allen from Penny Arcade, Alex Stacy from Loading Ready Run, and Alana Pierce from IGN. Or Peace, I think she said. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of the videos from PAX South, other than this one, will not be up until I upload the f Utena episode 14, which... I am editing fiercely as fast as I can. With your with your knob? Uh, the knob's going to come tomorrow. Oh, my God. I'm, I might just video myself using the knob. <laughs> I'm kind of excited about the knob. Rim loves fiddling knobs. I really should have bought that knob before. Mm. But the knob used to be way expensive. It was actually... So get this. The knob was cheaper at How long Staples. is he going on about his knob? I'm going to go talk about... Well, once I get the knob, I'm going to do a Let's Play of me using the knob. 
so much now. Because remember, we have a Patreon, and we have a goal, and if we hit that goal, you're going to get a bunch of videos of how I do Geek Nights. Like, here's Don't a video... give Rim any money. ...of me editing, like, the Utena video Rim has live. more money than you. Don't give him any. You're going to get so much video of me playing with my knob, you you're don't not want, even going to be able to deal with you it. You don't want that. Don't give him your money. If you're already giving your money, stop. <laughs> I got a very tender you thank you. You can make much better use of that money. I just got a very tender thank you that was addressed to both of us in the Patreon campaign. Don't do that. From someone who is very happy about Geek Nights. No, don't and be. very, very proud to be contributing to our, our cause. That person has a problem. <laughs> they have their priorities in life are all messed Otherwise, up. Otherwise, we're going to be at MAGFest, like, next weekend. Oh like, my. that's coming up real quick. Uh, MAGFest. You mean, yeah. Yeah. Two weekends from now. Next weekend. Not this weekend where we have nothing, but next weekend. That's right. Uh, we're going to be on between the two of us like seven goddamn panels. I don't know which ones I'm on. Get... I don't remember which ones Can I'm on. Can you make an itinerary for me? I'm going to show up and I'm going to go to the staff room and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll just be like John St. John. I'll just wander in kind of drunk and be like, so, uh, where do I have to be? Yeah, I need an itinerary. Just point me at the room and I'll show up. I need someone talk. to give me an itinerary because I don't know. At I'll... least we're doing the same panels that we did at PAX, except the Atari one, we can just totally change it up because... It's just the Atari one. We can do whatever. So I think we'll change some games. If my knob works, we're going to talk about some Kaboom. You're going to bring your knob to MAGFest? I'm bringing my knob to MAGFest if it works for Kaboom. Okay. We'll see if it works for Kaboom. So uh, you might have noticed me bitching on Twitter, which is kind of ironic. And the whole, I mean, rest in peace Twitter was uh, trending globally for a while. But basically a while ago, as you all know, Twitter added that lightning bolt that you click on by accident sometimes. And it has a bunch of ads and nonsense in there. And Twitter's been hinting for a while that they're going to get rid of the chronological timeline. Haven't we talked about this before? I think I've bitched about it, but we've never really talked about it. I feel like we've, we've talked it. about this a hundred times. I don't really understand why it has to be a main bit. I don't think what Do you have a better one? No. but All right, I, there we go. There we go. <laughs> put up. Get, get, I still feel like it's a rerun bleh. If you hand me something better, I will gladly take it. I could, now, just, I could just go home. That'd be better. So this issue is interesting for one reason to me, and that reason is it's coming out of a fundamental problem that I think a lot of tech companies, or at least companies that use technology in a very like social media open format, are going to run into increasingly where the investors or the people with stock want their money back. Right, well, this is why, so, you know, I hate Silicon Valley bullshit, right? But it seems to be the way to make a company these days, you know, the way to make a company in the 90s was you made a company... And then you IPO'd to get money. And it's if, you, if your money comes from an IPO, they expect you to be profitable. And you know what? Those companies weren't. So when they went under, it caused a big old crash. Yep. Nowadays, and the way to do things is, oh, we'll just, instead of IPOing, we'll get VCs to fund us. And then the VCs like buying lottery tickets and they know it and they don't give a shit for whatever reason. But you don't have to make any fucking money. The VCs just want you to become like big and popular so that you have a better chance of like getting bought. So their investment pays out, and then if whoever bought you, well, fuck them, I don't care, right? And now it doesn't ruin, like, the whole market, because you're not even on the market. But companies like Twitter, they eventually IPO or something, and then, uh-oh, we actually have to make money now. We actually need a real business. Like, none of these tech companies are real businesses that make any money and now, do anything valuable. Qualify that by the fact that Twitter makes $1.5 billion a year, and apparently that's not enough. Well, it must cost a lot to have all those computers. Yeah, because all, all, all that ASCII, got to get that pay ASCII all those going everywhere. It's ASCII everywhere. But also, it's just that even when you become a public company, they expect your profits to keep increasing. So even if you do manage to profit you know, from some mechanism, they expect you to go more and more and more and more, right? Like, look at GoPro. GoPro went public, and the, the stock went whoop, because it's like, whoa, this is clearly a really popular fucking thing, right? Everyone's buying these GoPro cameras everywhere. Yep. Counterpoint, and again, while I am a... And GoPro still profits. They sell plenty of cameras, stock but they're not, not great. doing any better than they used to, so the stock went... Ee. So a lot of people make the mistake, and again, I am not giving investment advice... Just got to make that clear. On Geek Nights, you will never hear legal or investment advice. Yes. Ever. Ever. But For, Unless a lawyer or investment professional comes on and says otherwise, but you won't hear it from us. When a company like GoPro that's been around and you think, wow, that company is really doing well. When they IPO, whatever price the stock is when it IPOs, it takes that into account. Mm -hmm. It's got to do better than that. 
from that the point GoPro, forward, I think IPO'd some at like twenty or thirty or something. Went up to like ninety at one point, and now it's like fifteen. And I never bought GoPro stock because I'm not stupid. <laughs> I would have, I would have invested in GoPro if I could have in the early I days. Mean, Chipotle, right? Chipotle was like, do you see they closed all the stores for like a norovirus meeting? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's like you know, it went up like woo, crazy big. And then now that it's like, oh, you know, well, not only is the whole market down in general, but, you know, now, no one's coming to our stores because we poisoned our customers. So, again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving any advice or I'm not making any predictions or anything. But the reason Chipotle is down isn't really because of the norovirus thing, <laughs> nor is it because of the food poisoning thing. It's probably because Chipotle's growth is unsustainable Due to the fact that minimum wage and things like that are right, a but that's big my concern. that's the point. I was I whole started this whole tangent of these other companies is that they Chipotle makes money. <laughs> They're pro- very profitable. They're just not making more profits than they used to. So even if Twitter profits, it, even if they make one and a half billion, if they on they IPO'd, which is the big mistake. So now once you IPO, you're expected to keep making more profit all the time. And if you make less profit or the same profit, that's not good. So you constantly, even if you have a successful, sustainable product like Twitter, they have to find a way to make more money. So they're going to fuck with it. And they're going to keep fucking with it as long as they're a public company forever. They're going to say, because they have to do, if you don't do anything, you obviously can't increase profits. You have to fuck with something. Now, there is another way to go. Like some companies just pay dividends out of the stock, and then people are happy with that. I got some stocks, but you have to keep. You can't you, even if you. Uh, well, then pay you just dividends, have to keep making money. You don't have to make more. But you money. have to keep doing something. Well, yeah, right? you have to keep making money. Like even if GoPro was giving out big dividends and kept having solid, you know, sales, they still have to make a GoPro Five, a GoPro Six, a GoPro Seven. You know, they have to keep doing something. Well, they just have to keep selling things or doing something right. that generates money. They can't, ju- but they can't just stay still and do the sell the one camera for all eternity. Well, maybe you could. Depends on how good that camera was. <laughs> it to be some fucking amazing camera. Yeah. Of course, even then, it'd be too amazing. Yes, yeah, then- so you can firmware flash this camera and it gets more megapixels. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, it turns out the iPhone 1 is the same as the iPhone 7. You just It's just firmware. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all just padding inside of that thing. Yeah, right. But the problem with Twitter specifically is that I don't think anyone ever had any idea how they were going to make money off of it. Ever. Well, Twitter was one of those accident companies like Flickr where they were originally making something else and they made Twitter by accident off a side project and then it became more successful than the thing they were actually doing. Yep. I mean, I didn't even adopt Twitter super early. I adopted it relatively early, though. Yeah, relatively. But, you know. When I was in Costa Rica. It was pretty much like a few weeks where it's like, Twitter, oh, that's some fad thing. And then a few weeks later, it's like, oh, thing's still around? All right. Yep. But now they need to make money. And I feel like no one in the company actually, at least the people who make the decisions, like the business people, I don't think any of them use Twitter. I don't think any of them, like, have any idea what Twitter actually is. No. And remember, well, Twitter's different things to different people, and that's part of the problem. Yeah, but I feel like what they want Twitter to be is a push feed of ads and celebrity nonsense at subscribers who consume it, and they make money off of the people paying to push that feed. Right. Well, when you have a company, right, you know, you usually what you want to do when you have a company and make more money is listen to your customers, and customers are the people who give you money, right? So if you're Twitter, the people who are tweeting and reading tweets are not your customers. The customers are the people who are giving you money. Which so is who's pe- giving you money right now? People who are buying your data and people who are buying ads. Or so the people who gave you money a long time ago. When Twitter makes decisions, right, they are really changing Twitter to serve the interests of those people. And the only thing they care about in terms of the people who use Twitter, the users who are not the customers, is Will we change something to make so many of them leave that it will actually make the customers upset, right? So it's like they don't actually give a shit if they piss off the users and they like they redesigned Twitter and there was a rabble and now the rabble's gone and everyone still uses Twitter. Well, because they didn't actually do it. At the time, you can go listen to Geek Nights from then. We definitely talked about this. People are just complaining because they hate change, but this isn't really a change. It's just like bullshit. You know, whatever. I think it actually looks better now. Yep. No one cares. But what they're talking about today, like the recent thing, 
Like it's fundamentally different from when like, oh, Facebook moved a button and now you're all freaking out. Right. This is more like Facebook became MySpace. Mm -hmm. Like they literally changed what it is that it does. It's like if you're changing the skin of a game versus changing the mechanics of the game. Right. And well, the other kind of side problem is that with a lot of products, like for example, TV or especially advertising, the customers actually want like the, like their target demographic, like the people they want to target that they're paying to target. They actually kind of want dumb people. Like they kind of want the well, people who aren't that discerning. And the kind like there is so there's a situation where you'll have a, a person who uses your service, but the customers don't care about that person. Like me personally, I don't see Twitter ads. I don't interact with Twitter ads. Ads don't work on me. So I'm just costing Twitter money. Like every time I look at you're Twitter, you're getting a free service. You're basically yeah. getting this communication platform, and you're not paying anything for it. Every just, time I search Twitter, I'm just costing them a little tiny bit of money. Yeah, every time I look at CPU Twitter, their CPU has to execute a search. Their network bandwidth has to send you some data. You know, and you don't pay them jack shit. Yeah. Now, you might say, oh, but Rim, you're providing them content that will make more people use Twitter. Yeah, I'm providing content for 1,127 people. Twitter doesn't give a shit about the people who use Twitter because I'm on here mm -hmm. entertaining them. A thousand people. That's less than the number of people in the panel room at PAX. Yeah, if Rim quit Twitter, their profits would go up by the amount of CPU resources that Rim uses. A which, number of people... Which is a lot because he's like a Twitter addict, so you'd be like... <laughs> a number of people greater... It might even add up to like a dollar or two a year in terms of just electricity. If I quit using Twitter, a number of people greater than zero but statistically less than one would quit using Twitter. <laughs> So, I don't matter at all, but I feel like my use case of Twitter is the only actually interesting thing Twitter does. Yes, you're the only, no one else using the same thing in a different way has any validity. Only the way I use it is valid. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's a real, The way like, you use Twitter that is different from the way I use it is not okay. Only the way I use it is good. I guess my question for you is, Scott, what do you use Twitter for? I use it for the same thing you use it for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there any way to make money off of you? On Twitter, uh, yes. All right. How would you, if you were Twitter and you wanted to make money off of Scots? How would you do it? Charge me for Twitter. Yeah, I'd pay for Twitter because <laughs> then I'd be the customer. Yeah. You know what? If I'm the customer, it'll just do what I want. <laughs> probably, I mean, we both use Twitter because it's a public chat room of all of our friends, and it's also a public chat room where there's another public. There's a bunch of other public chat rooms nearby, and I can kind of listen to all of them. So like. There's people that don't know me, but I, I know mean, who they Twitter are. Twitter isn't perfect. It could be better, but it's just all the people are, that I want to be are on there. So, And it would be hard to get all the people that I want to move to something else. So even though Twitter, I could probably make a better Twitter on my own, A, I couldn't handle that many users yeah. <laughs> without spending a lot of money. Or without using ass. Right. Uh, even then, I still have to pay for the ass. Yeah, you'd have to pay and for the ass. ass That's the is problem. more expensive than you know, make your own ass. Depends. <laughs> uh, and all those people I want to be on there wouldn't come over and abandon Twitter for it. So that's really the value of Twitter is, you know, for me, is I want to be chatting with those people that I follow and I, that people that follow me who want to hear from me. I want them to hear from me when I have something to say. Yep, but I feel like, because Twitter, I mean, the ways they've tried to monetize are analyzing and or selling their data, mm -hmm. which, sure, Sure, go ahead, that. whatever, you can yeah, have it. I don't really care. I mean... That's you, how you I want, You want to collect data about my YouTube video I retweeted? Go nuts. Yep. I mean, I pay it. for YouTube with the data that they get from my videos and the people who pay for Red. I pay for YouTube directly with YouTube Red. Yeah. I don't. So anytime, like, if you watch our panel video, even once, I get a tiny amount of money. There. Well, how long do you have to watch it for? I have no idea. I, watched I, can it, check, for, I, I can, watched it for one second to make sure it works. So I actually was looking at the stats. The money that the, the Geek Nights Rim YouTube channel gets is about 50-50 between people who see ads and people who pay for YouTube Red and watch the I'd videos. I'd be really curious how many total people out of all YouTube users pay for Red and how many, but also... Last month, I got about 12 bucks from people who pay for YouTube Red. I think the YouTube Red numbers are way lower than the non-YouTube Red numbers, but I want to see the YouTube Red hours per person average. Oh, I think the YouTube Red people watch off. Fuck ton of That's YouTube. That's what I'm saying. I, I mean, want to also see like YouTube red total hours versus non YouTube red total hours. Right? There's be some interesting information there I want to know. Yeah, YouTube red is YouTube red is like the perfect example of how to monetize something effectively. Yeah, give me Twitter blue, I'll pay for it as long as I get awesome stuff like yeah. no ads and You know such. what? 
I, I pay what? 12 bucks a year for Flickr? I'd pay 12 bucks a year for Twitter. I'd pay 24. I use t- Twitter made them way more than Flickr. Yeah. I might even pay them per, like a small amount per month, like a couple bucks a month. Yeah. Now, the thing is, we or, we talked about this because uh, someone, you know, a while ago when I re- found this uh, quote from some advertising guy or whatever. But if we, when you pay to make ads go away, you're identifying yourself as person with money, which makes advertisers want to pay more to see you. Yeah. For, so then if, if we pay for Twitter with no ads. Someone's going to offer then them They're going to turn around billions. and be like, right, like. Oh my God! If we could show an ad only to the people who pay for Twitter Blue, I would pay you like a zillion dollars, and Twitter would be like, "Oh, okay." And then it's like, I will pay even more money to make them not see this ad, right? And then Twitter's like, "Okay." Because, and even though you know a lot, some of you work in advertising, and uh, you occasionally disagree with me on Twitter. And one, fuck you. But two, uh, the fundamental idea of advertising is that you are paying to force other people to watch something they don't want to see. If they want to see right. it, You're it's not advertising; it's right. research. You're paying it to basically like steal someone's a part of someone's life, you know, and, and infest what one or more of their five senses with you know sensory inputs that you want to put there that they don't want to put there. Because if I want to find out what movies are coming, I might go to a movie and see the trailers because I chose to walk into that room and watch them, or I might ignore the trailers and like come into after the trailers start. I get right, to it's pay. like you are paying to force me to hear something I don't want to hear, or see something I don't want to see. It's like torture that you bought. Yeah, you plus it's like someone has a torture device and you rented it from them and chose the the means of torture. It's also very telling that ninety percent of the torture that is inflicted upon me is car ads. Guess who's never gonna fucking buy a car? And, and Actually, you know I'm thinking, if I do buy a car, it'll be like a Ferrari or some shit, and they don't advertise. Yeah, really. or I'm gonna buy to. either that, or I'm gonna buy the cheapest possible car because I don't care. Or I'll be—I mean, I'm only gonna buy a car if I'm so rich that I can afford like the car and a garage to put it. Actually, in Actually, and I, whatnot. So. Funnily enough, I am thinking about buying a car. <laughs> Can you afford a garage space? So, because Zipcar got so expensive, I was actually looking into this. And if you and I split a lease on a car and paid for parking, there is a parking spot available at my building for one fifty a month. So if we, so if if we got if we got parking for less than two hundred a month, it would be one fifty a month at my apartment. And a perpetual lease where you just like get a new car every couple years and you pay like. Two hundred a month for the lease, which so those exist. So three fifty a month plus taxes divided by two, so like two hundred a month. I'm not paying that. So two hundred a month nope. would be cheaper. You than know what I can get for two hundred a month? I could upgrade my internet speed to like a zillion megabits, but and get cable TV that I wouldn't watch. It would be cheaper than all the combined rental cars, and when we take buses or Amtrak's to places that we could e- more easily drive to combined per year. I'm not paying twenty four hundred dollars a year for something I'm hardly going to use. Yeah, you're not, not going to go to Wildwood? For, uh, not paying $200 a month to go to Wildwood once a year. Because I'm gonna because if, if I rent a car to go to Wildwood, I'm charging you for that shit now. Sure. It's expensive. You rent, right. So you rent the car. Even if the rent-a-car costs what? Is it costing $2,400? It'll cost it, It'll cost like 300 bucks to get it for the weekend. Great. That's fine. That's 300 bucks a year, not 2400 a year, and I got the same amount of transportation. So what if we go to Wildwood twice? Fine. 600 We had to go to Wildwood four times. For it to be worth or we go to Wildwood twice. We go. We use that car to go to like Scojo party and then Albany party, and suddenly it's break even. It had to be like at least once a month. So Scott, somewhere. here's the magic: if we get oh, one, oh, and then you're not counting the cost of the gas and the maintenance and the pain in the ass parts and shoveling. the If snow you rent off cars, you got to pay for that shit anyway. Shoveling the snow, you don't have to shovel snow off a rent a car. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, I could probably use Task Rabbit and pay for someone to come and do it. Got to pick how much does that cost? Like five <laughs> bucks. Uh huh. I actually looked at that. It cost. There was someone you could, for five bucks. They would come and get all the snow off your car. Mm. They wouldn't shovel it, but they get all the snow off. Of it, I like need the snow you to dig ice. my car out completely as if it was a rent a car. I think that'd be like fifteen or twenty bucks. Yeah. Well, now I might as well get the rent a car. So there's gonna be indoor parking for 125 right there when that building finishes. One tw- what? One twenty five. Whoa, mine is outdoor parking for one fifty. Yeah, because there's gonna be a whole parking garage in there. But you gotta live in one of these buildings to get access to it. Yeah. Which oh, I do. And, oh, you can live in this building and buy parking in this. This is building? all one complex. Even that building that's right there? The all the yellow buildings are one big complex. Oh, okay. But Scott, here's the magic. If we get one more person in on this car. Okay, yeah, if we divide it one more way. Like Chase, then, then it would, it's then set. It, then it'd be like 125 a month. Yeah, then like suddenly it gets good. I would pay 100 a month if I could have a car, and maybe 100. That's like a borderline. Anyway. Twitter, yeah. T- tangent, yeah, so Twitter. Tangent much? But, uh, so Twitter started selling ads 
And I started just flagging every ad I see if I use the main, because I don't use any of those. People keep telling me, oh, use this weird Twitter client. I use TweetDeck in Chrome on the PC, yeah. which has no ads. But when I'm on the iPhone, I use the regular Twitter client, which has ads. Yeah. And, it's and I use TweetDeck because I'm like setting up all my scheduled tweets and like all my nonsense. But I just go to the Twitter website at work. Like I'm not going to lie. Oh, I use TweetDeck at work. Nah, I just use the Twitter website because it's fine. I actually see so few ads because every time I do see an ad, I flag it as offensive, Mm -hmm. and Twitter won't show it to me again. Mm -hmm. So what I found is if you keep flagging every ad you see as offensive, eventually you start seeing, like, the weird ads. I started seeing a bunch of ads for, like, cults, like Scientology. Mm -mm. I started seeing, like, Mormon ads. I started seeing, like, a lot of weird, like, like not, like, homeopathy. You know, the Mormons bought ads and the playbills for Book of Mormon. (laughs) <laughs> How you like that? You know what? Plus one to Mormons for having a sense of humor. That's actually also probably not the worst idea. Cause you know, compared to other cults, the Mormons, they kill you with niceness. Yeah. Right? I'll take the Mormons over Scientology any day. <laughs> sure. But then I started seeing ads for like, Furry, like, cosplay nonsense. Well, stop retweeting furry cosplay nonsense. No, so a bunch of other people were talking about this. You see this, we- and also, anime. I've been seeing some Twitter ads related to the things I tweeted. I saw the most ads for specifically cosplay lenses to stick in your eyes. I haven't seen any of those. I saw nothing but ads for How that. many cosplay people are you following? Because I'm following one. Uh, One. Probably the same person <laughs> you're following. Probably, yeah. So, when I started flagging those as offensive, I never saw any cosplay or furry nonsense again, ever. As soon as I flagged one, like, lens in your eyes, like fake contact lens to make your eyes look like something as offensive... Why don't you make a little thing that automatically... Like, keeps flagging Twitter ads as offensive all the time until eventually all the ads are offensive. So, actually, I haven't seen any Twitter ads for a couple months now, so I think I did it. Whoa. I think I flagged everything. Maybe I'll... Ha- how do you you got to show me how to flag as offensive. If you if you just go to the website and you see oh, an ad... Oh, it's easy on the website. Just click on the X. How do you do it in the app? Uh, I don't know. I don't see them in the app anymore. All right. So, I only do it on the website. I just click on the X, and it's like, tweet was offensive. Tweet appeared too often. Tweet was irrelevant. See, I used... Th- the problem I've had sometimes is I was I did do a thing for a while where I'd block the account of whoever bought the ad. I did that for a long time. The problem is is that then you get in a situation where you might have actually wanted to see something they tweeted. For example, uh, maybe McDonald's tweeted in, you know made a tweet and then promoted that tweet. But, you know, and then you got in your timeline. And you, I don't want to see that shit. So you want to bl- if you block the McDonald's account, okay, sure, you're not going to see that ad anymore. Great. But then your friend retweets a funny picture of Grimace and some Fry Guys, and now you can't see that shit because you blocked all of McDonald's, even though that wasn't an ad. Yep. Pay attention, advertisers. See the difference between the two? I mean, it was an ad because it was from McDonald's. But I chose to see it. Right. You know, I wanted to see funny Grimace. Well, it's because I didn't follow the McDonald's account. I followed my friend whom I trust. And my friend showed me that thing. If my friend retweeted everything McDonald's did, I would stop following them. Yeah, that's why Twitter works. You follow the people you care about, and you or like don't maybe follow McDonald's the tweets on like the you know 25th anniversary of McKids. It's probably the 30th anniversary of McKids yeah. at this point. But you know what I'm saying. But the problem with the Twitter ads is that, as far as I can gather, they did not make money. No. So Twitter seems to want to I mean, make money. If you now. were buying ads. You know, because you're evil. Would you buy ads on Twitter? Dude, nah. Probably I would because you can probably get them real cheap <laughs> right now. I probably would buy ads on Twitter. Probably buy a gonna shit be, ton of ads on but Twitter. Conver- it's going to be a waste of money. You could have spent that money on something useful. But I'd be buying ads to get people who are too stupid to block ads. Maybe. That's the whole point. I'm going after those people. If I want to go after people like me, I would do press releases about my product and hope that the product was something that Rim cares about. I see so many companies being successful without any marketing whatsoever uh, that I feel like it's you know there's no reason to buy ads if you can just, just put your effort into your product. You know what? They might have marketing. They don't have advertisements. Right. There's a, there's, advertisements are at one tool in the marketer's toolkit. Mm-hmm. But so now it, I feel like what Twitter's trying to do with this change that may or may not be coming, I mean, it was leaked that it's happening is instead of having a guaranteed feed, and remember, Facebook used to have a guaranteed feed too, where if I follow Daryl Surratt, I'm guaranteed to see everything he tweets in my timeline when he tweeted it. 
And if I tweet something, I know that every single one of my followers, all thousand of them. Except for the ones that muted you. Yeah, which there's a few, I assume. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you mute me? Is that what's going <laughs> on here? <laughs> but they, they at least could see it if they wanted to. Facebook shed all over that idea. And now if you say something, it's kind of random whether or not everyone who follows you sees it. They may or may not. If you want to guarantee they see it, you got to pay. And I feel like that's the model Twitter wants because they feel like Facebook makes money with it and they can't come up with anything better than that because the new system is basically instead of a just a timeline of everything everyone you know tweeted, it's an algorithm that decides what you might like based on what's relevant. And they're really trying to brand Twitter to be that moments tab that no one clicks on. Like, who is the person who clicks on moments? Like, I'm going to click on it right now. What's in here? They must have data for who clicks on it, but it's not me. You know what it is? It's just a shitty news feed. Here, Leonardo DiCaprio and Lady Gaga something something at a lunch. Really? That's that's like the top thing here. Oh, and a riot and in shouldn't this Hong be, Kong. I mean, shouldn't this be using the things that Twitter knows about you to show you things that you want to see? It's telling me about Kanye and Yeezy or something. Uh, right, I mean, they're figuring out what ads to show. They figured out enough about Ram that they knew that they should show him cosplay-related ads and furry-related ads. <laughs> but they couldn't figure up enough about Ram that he doesn't know that to know that he doesn't know who Yeezy is. Nor do I give a shit about Leonardo DiCaprio and Lady Gaga schmoozing at a luncheon 19 minutes ago. <gasps> so that literally ruins Twitter if it turns into this, and it ruins it in subtle ways because. If you're, if the the stuff I see is what Twitter's algorithm thinks will make them money, that is literally opposite of what I actually want to see. Which right now is my friend Cat Small complaining about jet lag. Uh, Joshua A. C. Newman shouldn't starting be, a shouldn't Patreon. Shouldn't you be doing what you always do and tell people, oh, there's no such thing as jet lag. Eh. Uh, d well, no, there's not no such thing as jet lag. I'm just immune to it. Uh huh. I am. Uh -huh. I, I hundred percent am. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Andrew complaining about Deadpool. Someone making a joke about druids. This picture of a pretzel. We should send Rim into space and then wait for it to be like, you know, noon his time and then have him land where it's midnight in the, after like 10 days in space. Uh, Scott, I've done that many times. I've flown to like Hong Kong and lived there a week and then flown right back to New York. Emily has seen me land and be totally fine and then let's go out to dinner. And he's secretly sleeping on the inside. <laughs> I'll get tired sometimes because I was on a plane for 25 hours. But that's what jet lag is. No, that's not what jet lag is. <laughs> oh, that's not what jet lag is, then I don't have it either because all I do is get tired sometimes. <laughs> is, what, do you, what, is, what is jet lag? So it's do not you, being tired. Do you, like, if your time zones, like, if it's, if it's night where you are now, but it's morning where you left from, do you wake up at 3 a.m. and can't go back to sleep? No. Then, that, yeah, that's jet lag. Do you... Get hungry at the wrong time, but then not be hungry when you should be able to eat and feel nauseous when you try to eat? The timing might be, the, I don't get nauseous, no, but the timing of hungriness might be a little off that first day. Like when we got to Australia, I think it was like a weird time. And I that was like, is actually a symptom of jet lag. And, but then, it, like, you know, by the second meal, it's I'm on the like, See, the I might actually schedule. experience that, except I'm always hungry anyway, so <laughs> I'm always hungry. So I'm way hungry right now. I'm actually fading. I am so fucking hungry. Like, I don't have any energies right now. So, yeah, in sum... Twitter might try to monetize their platform by literally making it a shitty version of Facebook. If anyone uh, wants to help me make the replacement Twitter or is making the replacement Twitter and needs me on their team, I have the perfect design for it and I know how to code it. Uh, I just don't want to put all that effort in, so lend me your keyboard. Lend us your ass. Lend us your keyboard. Ass and your effort. Yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.
The patrons this week, in order of the amount of money they give us, are Nicholas Brandau, Rebecca Dunn, John R. Nobbs II, Amanda Duchette, James David White, Christian Coombs, Jess, Sam Cordry, Mechanical Mind, William Eisenrose. You expected the next name to be yours, but it was me, Dio. Clinton Walton, MySteady.com, Phil Ulrich, Renee from New Zealand, Robert Lee, Ryan Perrin, Drew Oppenla- Openlander, Rare Lavelle, Brian Cedroni, Rochelle Montanona, Finn Eric Silverod, and then he placed a single finger upon his mustache. Kinetic Man, Aaron Cerise, Chris Midkiff, Chris Knox. It was a dark and stormy night. Daniel Redman, Chris Haddad, Doug Schneider, Sean Klein, Chris Reimer, and Thomas Hahn. Uh, we had a week of skiing, me and Emily, and before that was Pack South. I have the first video from Pack South, the horror panel I was up out. Fear not. While I have the video for the rest of the PAX panels, none of that is going up until the next Utena episode, episode 14, is up. And I'm literally about a third of the way through putting that thing together. So stay tuned. I think it'll be up in the next week or two. We also just recorded the February Q&A. So that's going to go up, or the January Q&A. That's going to go up real soon, probably tomorrow, Wednesday. And I will very soon also open the submission form for the February Q&A. But for now, I leave you with something that I forgot existed, and now it is stuck in my head. It may be my thing of the day on Wednesday, but here it is. I defy you to not get this stuck in your head. My boy, making pickles is easy as pie. Just watch what I do, then you give it a try. This is the pull'em, and this is the push'em. Just pull on the pull'em, and push on the push'em, and the pickles go into the jars. Just pull on the pull'em, and push on the push'em, and the pickles go into the jars. What a wonderful way to spend every day. You should thank your lucky stars. Just pull and push, just push and pull. How simple it is for those jars to get full. Just a pull on the pull and a push on the push and the pickles go into the jars. Tra la la, the pickles go into the jars. And now you know all there is to be known. I proudly pin you with the badge of Dill Pickle Pickler, Junior Grade. Pickle away, young fellow. Happy Pullum, happy Pushum. <laughs> <laughs>